Hello everyone. My name is Patricia McCarthy and I'm lucky enough to be a docent here at the Springfield Museums. We're here today at the George Walter Vincent Smith Museum. This is one of the five museums in the fabulous complex that we have here in Springfield. Today I'd like to share some information about the beautiful plaster casts that are on permanent display here at this museum. These plaster casts were initially installed in 1899. They were purchased from the estate of Horace Smith, who was one of the founders of Smith & Wesson. At that time, these plaster casts provided many visitors with the only contact that they would have had with these great works of art. The expense of travel to places where the original sculptures are located was prohibitive for most people. Plaster casts were made from molds of original Greek sculptures. Most of these original marble sculptures are in the great museums of the world. The British Museum, the Louvre, the Acropolis Museum in Athens. The conditions that we see with these casts, the broken limbs for example, are the result of the original sculptures surviving centuries of wars, earthquakes, and the general wear and tear of time. In the late 19th century, most major American museums had plaster casts in their collections. The list includes many of the notables, the Met, the Carnegie, Chicago. Many colleges also own plaster casts, Harvard, Yale, and more locally, Amherst and Mount Holyoke. The casts were utilized by the colleges and also in the art classes that were offered here at our museum as excellent sketching models. As time went on into the early 20th century, there was a general feeling in the art world that plaster casts were not truly original works of art, that plaster casts were not worthy of being displayed in museums. It was at this point that many museums destroyed their collections. Fortunately, our collection was simply placed in storage. In 1978, the thinking changed once again. It was then that our museum was able to restore the cast and reinstall the collection in its original gallery. As an addendum, plaster casts from original works can no longer be made. It's been determined that there's a danger of damaging the integrity of the original. So here we are, ready to enjoy the George Walter Vincent Smith Museum's collection of plaster casts. We're all familiar with the three-dimensional statue. This is perhaps the most common form of sculpture. It's meant to be seen in a 360 degree arc. We can walk completely around this form of sculpture. We'll be looking at some of these sculptures as we go along, but for convenience, we'll start here with another quite common form of sculpture, a relief. When a sculpture is meant to be displayed on a flat surface, a wall for example, the back of the sculpture obviously has to be flat, as we see here. This particular form of sculpture is called a relief. A relief is generally meant to tell a story. In this marvelous relief, we see Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, helping her father, Zeus, fight to push the titans under the earth. If Zeus and Athena were successful in defeating the titans, they would bring law and order to the world. This is truly a magnificent piece. When more than one individual relief is joined with other reliefs and once again tell a story, the work is referred to as a frieze. The outstanding frieze that we see surrounding this entire area is taken from the pediment of the Parthenon, the sacred temple of Athena. The scene is frequently described as the procession to honor Athena with personal gifts on her birthday. We see men in chariots, people carrying water jars, people carrying gifts, animals, perhaps for sacrifice. We see gods, usually seated, implying that they would be larger than the humans, all gathered to honor Athena on her birthday. 
Now, many scholars are reluctant to accept the idea that this frieze depicts the festival of bringing gifts to Athena, as this would be quite a departure from the normal practice of only using mythological characters in decorative sculpture. Perhaps for now, we can simply admire the magnitude and artistry of this beautiful frieze. There are 300 figures in the entire piece. It's three feet in height, the length of two football fields. It is an unbelievable work of art. The most popular artifacts in the collection are the individual statues and of course the myths associated with them. Myths are generally stories or beliefs of events that have no explainable validity. All cultures have used myths to teach lessons and Greek myths are particularly enjoyable. Let's start with the story of Orpheus and his wife Eurydice. Orpheus was the god of music who played the lyre. When Orpheus and Eurydice were on a picnic, Eurydice was bitten by a snake and died. Orpheus was so bereaved that he no longer played his lyre. Everyone missed the wonderful music that Orpheus had played, and they encouraged Orpheus to travel to Hades to see if Eurydice could return to Earth. Hades, the god of the underworld, granted Orpheus his request, but with the agreement that Orpheus walk in front of Eurydice's and to not look back until they reached Earth. Everything was so quiet as they were walking. And then, as you can imagine, curiosity got the best of Orpheus. Sure enough, he looked back and that ended the agreement. Eurydice was returned to Hades. And the moral of that story is, you cannot go back on your word. Some add the additional moral, you cannot escape death. In the interest of time, I'll end our time together with my favorite myth. This myth involves more than one god. We'll start here with the messenger of the god, Hermes. Hermes is generally depicted with a staff and winged sandals. The staff was to awaken the souls of the dead in the underworld, and the winged sandals allowed Hermes to fly to deliver messages from Zeus. One of Hermes' deliveries from Zeus was to Pandora, the bride of the brother of Prometheus. Now Zeus had been angry with Prometheus and his brother for giving fire to earth. So we decided to send a gift to Pandora. The gift arrived with instructions to not open the box. Now Pandora could hear something rattling when she shook the box. Needless to say, like Orpheus, curiosity also got the best of Pandora and she opened the box. Out of the box flew all the miseries of the world, war, sickness, anger, poverty, Pandora quickly closed the box, but once again, she could hear a rattling. And once again, she decided to open the box. In the box, there was one remaining message. And that last remaining message was hope. And let this be the perfect message for all of us to take away today, hope. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed everything, and we all look forward to seeing you here at the George Walter Vincent Smith Museum.